who want to listen to the session, they will still have access to it. I want to officially open this session. My name is Talipani Chitwamuromon. I am the executive chairperson of the Universal Greening Organization. The entity is based in Midrand, but we have got a national footprint. So what we do as the organization is environmental programs where we teach communities about conservation, but also ensure that we assist small organizations that want access in the environmental space to capacitate them. But part of what we do is we have got a network. It's called the Universal Greening Network. What it does, it's entirely to ensure that the small NGOs and professionals who want access to uh, expert-led discussions, and I think this is one of the sessions where we invite different experts in different areas to unpack different issues entirely to ensure that people get to understand uh, what is happening out there and what are the dynamics in different areas. So in this case, as much as we focus on, the co on, on conservation, but we believe that conservation is for people by people. And when you are doing that, you then need to integrate different areas of interest where we need to then unpack models that are used to ensure that people are able to achieve whatever activities they are doing. So we've invited you here, Mr. Songe Zuzivi, knowing exactly your background, but also your interest in the issues of corporate governance, also looking at the issues of a public-private partnership. So this is the model that has been introduced, that has been working for some time, but we thought it would be important to interrogate it and check if indeed the public-private partnership model is effective and it's, it's achievable, but also what are the model, what are other ways that we can use to ensure that even the NGOs can be part of that particular uh, partnership and they can contribute with their skills, but also their available resources, which is human resource, but also access to uh, other areas of interest. Basically, that's just what we want to do, uh, Mr. Songezo Zivi. We, we have got you here today, but we also have got Mr. Gabriel Tembuzani, uh, who is known as Vafui on Mubango. We want him to just unpack the issues of personal branding because we've realized that there's a need, as much as you're in conservation, as much as you're running a non-profit organization, you need to also build a brand that this brand can be, repre I mean, can represent out there. So he will then engage. You've got uh, 30 minutes of your presentation or your analysis. After that, you can then have the colleagues who are here to interrogate and question you and engage you on what you have presented. From there, we will then bring in uh, the Gabriel Tembuzani. If you will be with us until the entire uh, session ends, that will be a plus. But if you are going to be busy with other things, we will then allow you to exit after you have introduced yourself, done your presentation, and people have uh, engaged with you. I think without waste of time, I'll welcome you and allow you the space to then take over and take us through that which you know best. Thank you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you so much for having me and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I have to say that uh, one of my frustrations, uh, which I suspect is a frustration you probably share, is that when the, there is a conversation, particularly about climate change, it all comes down to just coal, right? Uh, you know, do you support coal or not? That's all that seems to matter uh, these days. And and I come from a from a village where it's a it's a lot more complicated than that. We've kind of forgotten about good old environmental conservation. Is it okay if I close the window? I apologize because. I don't want the noise to interfere with what we're doing. Thank you. So it's it's a lot more than that. It's about environmental. It's about nature conservation, and and so on. so I'm I'm really uh, privileged to to talk to you guys given the work that you're doing and how really important it is. But 
on the topic of public-private partnerships. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and provide more time for for a conversation. So I'm going to provide a provocation for say about 10 to 12 minutes. Offer my thoughts and follow the guide of what you've said to you've sent to me uh, to help me prepare for this session. And then we can have a, a conversation. And I'm going to start with a with a few philosophical points. And and the first one is you know, when you account of South Africa's history, there is a, and, and the relationship between public-private, right? Usually the private is understood to mean business, to mean big business, <laughs> right? And there is an inherent mistrust in, uh, in, in, in business, especially from those that are engaged in politics and liberation politics in particular. The problem with that mutual suspicion is that without trust, it becomes difficult to trust one another to do what we've undertaken to do and make sure that we work together to meet the common objective. So that is a big problem. And that is why you will hear me from time to time talking about a revolving door in inverted commas. I don't mean it in a cynical way, mm -hmm. but people who aren't in government can work in government at some point and work out of government at some point. People who are in business can go into government at some point and vice versa, right? So especially at a professional level, I think that's really important. We've also encouraged the concept of young people and, and when our list of candidates for this election comes out, you'll see a lot of young people who are professionals who come from civil society organizations and so on. And what we say to them is that, you know, national service, is not a thing that you only do from one perspective. If you are 30 years old or 28, you may become an MP or a member of the provincial legislature for five years. And then you decide, I have done my bit. I am going to go back and be an accountant again. I have represented uh, the South African people. I've done lots of hard work in trying to come up with the right legislation, the right oversight. And I believe we've done some things that others can take forward. So, so in other words, is get a general sense of ownership of the whole country and then play different roles uh, in line with uh, in line with uh, our professional and other experience so that the country becomes better overall. What we get locked into now is that oh so and so is in the private sector and therefore we cannot trust them. Oh, so-and-so is in politics right now. And so if we are in the private sector, we don't trust them because we don't like politicians. We're cynical about politicians here and that sort of thing. And I don't think it needs to be like that. Now, the reason I'm starting there is that if you want public-private partnerships to work, you've got to have in different spheres of society, people who generally believe in the same vision who share, say, the same principles, right, about what is morally correct for the people of South Africa to do, for the country, and so on. And if that can influence legislation, policy, administrative actions, investment by the government, by the private sector, then it works. So I will provide a few examples from overseas that I have been involved in, and I will provide, in fact, an example from Europe that I have been involved in, that I've observed closely. I will provide an example from South Africa that I have been involved in, which I believe at a macro level is a, is a kind of example of a public-private partnership, as it were, that involves policy. And then I will talk about what we also need to do, and then I will shut up, and then we can have a conversation. So the first time I went, I, I started working for Volkswagen in 1998. And in 2001, they sent me overseas. And it was not long after Germany was unified. And so the eastern part of Germany was underdeveloped. And the western part of Germany was modernized and well-developed. Even when you went to Berlin, West Berlin was modern. East Berlin was old and dilapidated. And so German companies, including my own, decided in by agreement, because that was a national conversation at the time, that they're going to build some factories in the eastern part of Germany to create employment there, to create centers of economic activity and so on. 
and they did that on their own, but the government provided infrastructure and so on to make sure that it happens. That's So if you see a Touareg today, a Volkswagen Touareg, it's built, yeah. in, the eastern, it's built in the eastern part of Germany. And let me, let it, me. it came out of that. Uh, it came out of that a uh, kind of a uh, investment, as a as an example, right? So these can happen where the government says, "Listen, let's work together to produce this outcome. You do this, we do that, and we'll meet our end of the bargain. You meet your end of the bargain, we get the social outcome." And so over the years, even though the gap between east and west in terms of socioeconomic metrics is still there, it's narrowing because of investments like that by Siemens and other companies. That's one example at a macro level. Let me share with you the story of my own career at Volkswagen. I started in my third year, I was doing in-service training. I was at P-Technicon doing public relations. And they said to me, listen, you are probably our last student that we are taking because we, the factory may get closed because it's not profitable and all of these kind of things. But there was a program called the Motor Industry Development Plan but it needed to save the factory. It needed the unions to sign a new agreement with management. It needed the union and management to go and make a presentation to the board in Germany together about what their joint plan was. was. And it also needed other actors in what was then Jutnik and Port Elizabeth to make commitments in terms of how the whole thing would work. So what did you end up with? Government makes policy. The company, the union makes certain decisions, they partner with management, right? On the agree on strategy and that sort of thing. They go and bid together. And then they come back, they win the contract. There are some targets to be met, things for the government to do, the municipality, the province, and so on. The current minister of finance was an MEC in the Eastern Cape. And guess what? It worked. The Volkswagen factory is still there. There are many other factories around it and so on. And I got a career. And I could work there for eight years, right? So that's another example. But in this moment in South Africa, what should public-private partnerships look like? I think, again, we share a vision. And this needs for the politicians, and I am one now, and the government to not believe they have a monopoly on the vision, right? In other words, the other actors don't have to buy into your manifesto. That's not what it's about. You get into a conversation that says, what is your vision of this area that we're talking about, of this issue that we're talking about, and how it can be resolved, and how do you want to contribute? And you try and meet each other halfway within the context of the legal framework that you've got, right? The best way for public-private partnerships to work is that each has got a clearly identified role within their areas of strength. That when you put the two efforts together, they produce a wonderful outcome. What does that do? It helps to build trust. You don't take people out of what they're already passionate about, what they want to do, but you are saying where you're falling short, if I'm government, I'm going to close the gap. You do X, Y, Z that we're not able to do so that the whole thing comes together. And I think that model has been proven to work. But in order to do that, we need to deal with the culture of mistrust. Because if you, you were to ask for my analysis of why they don't work, it is this tendency to say, oh, we've got a program as government. You guys support it and we'll do a public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. I don't believe in working like that. Yes, we can say we've got a vision, if you're a government. This is the data that we've used. This is where we want to get there. If, however, you feel you have a more efficient way and a faster way of getting to the outcome. Or if there's anything we've missed about the outcome, let's have that conversation. And then we do what is best for everybody. And I think that's a model that I experienced in, uh, in Yutnik, where the government didn't get involved in a discussion between the union and management, <laughs> right? The government did their bit. So those that are involved in the factory did their bit. The provincial government did its bit. The city of Port Elizabeth is now Nelson Mandela Bay, did its bit, and everybody met their commitments. And someone like me could have a career and change my life and have an income and that sort of thing. And thousands of people were able to do that, were able to have a career and, 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 and sustain themselves. So I think, I hope I've shared some principles, but 
let me close by making maybe a specific example about something that is perhaps not a not and i will use the the, the area in which you are about environmental conservation because it's important so i visit communities now daily almost daily the uncollected trash is is beyond uh, the state of rivers is unbelievable the state of parks is disturbing they now of course the conversation always is yeah but the government doesn't come and pick up the rubbish okay mm -hmm. but i've also ridden in cars with people who litter out of the window that's not for government's role to play <laughs> right okay All right. like pick up after yourself do certain things as a community and so on so what i'm trying to say is again there is no sense of shared responsibility. People aren't saying we are not doing these things because the government, these things are not happening because the government is not meeting us halfway, right? People sometimes just sit and say, well, they haven't collected the rubbish and so it's piling up and there's nothing we can do. There are instances where that happens. We have seen things work beautifully is where private citizens, private entities, uh, community organizations, NGOs and so on, decide to take charge of the visioning. And they say, this is what we want for our area. This is our vision for our area. These are the things that we are going to do. Our only frustration is that the government is not helping us out. It's a much more energizing battle to go and fight because the people have a plan. And I don't want to talk about rise in Zanzi all the time, but the point, the point we always make to people is that have a plan. Always have a plan, have an idea of what you want your community to be like, your region to be like. And when you engage with government, you're not asking what is your plan. When you engage with business people, you're not saying what is your plan for us. You are saying, here's our plan. We live here. We know what's wrong. And we know what can be done to fix it. What do you think? <laughs> right? Yeah. And it's a mindset change. But when the people have done it, I must tell you the results have been amazing because they take charge the conversation is more equal than it otherwise could have been there is less waiting there is more focus in terms of what the outcome should be and when and and, and the very last thing i'll say is that that requires that all of us do three things one we gain confidence in the value of our respective experiences two we partner with others with an open mind Three, the outcomes for each party involved in the public-private partnership know exactly what their targets are and what they must do and by when. If there are all those three things, the fourth one becomes possible, and that is accountability. <laughs> because you're not talking about, oh, this should have happened. You're like, okay, we said we're going to do this within two weeks. We've done our bit. You haven't. Where have you fallen short? Why have you fallen short? How can we help you? And, and I think if we entrench that culture and philosophically accepted what I said in the beginning about people moving between sectors, then these things become easier over time. Let me shut up and uh, at least give us uh, some time to have a conversation and I can answer further questions and so on. Yeah. No, thank you so much, Mr. Zibi. I think you did justice to our subject, which is the public-private partnership. And I think where you started, where you talk about shared vision, I think yeah. that's the most important thing now, where we need to also look at, where you find the government, the NGOs, business, civil society, and people on the, on the ground having the same vision about a particular subject. And yeah. I'll, give, I'll give the issues of waste, for an example. You brought that. When you move in our townships, you'll realize that there is a lot of illegal dumpings. And when you try and interrogate this, because this is what we do every day, when you try and check with the communities to say, why do we have illegal dump here next to your house? Uh, you will always find that the government is not coming to pick the waste, like you indicated. But I want to then look at the issues of a shared vision. And this shared vision, vision must be also enabled it must also be resourced because I think that's where the, the missing link is. The people are there on the ground. They might not 
currently what I've seen is people people do not know what needs to be done in other areas. In other areas, people know and neglect it. But there is an element where people are promised to say, we will do this for you. So I want us to look at a space where if we are to talk about a shared vision, where should it start? Who should initiate this vision? Who should guide it? Who should give direction in terms of saying we are in Alexander, uh, we are not going to have illegal dump here. If we are to go the public private partnership approach, who should then be at the forefront of ensuring that there is no illegal dump in Alexander and who should ensure that it's maintained throughout. So I think let's unpack that uh, having talking about a shared vision. Who should lead that vision? Who should who should be at the forefront? So when I left uh, my job at APSA and we uh, we co-founded the Rivonia Circle, one of the things we did, so there's a set of workshops at Rivonia Circle called the Democracy Builder. They are seemingly about politics, but they're actually about a lot more. One of the things that those workshops do is in every community, you get the people that come to the workshop and usually it's 30 to like 80 people, is to learn how to have a vision for their area. And it's a broad vision. It's not just about environment. So the early part of the conversation is you let them gripe, you let them complain. Oh, there's too much trash, write it down. Oh, there's too much this, write it down. Not enough of this, write it down. Okay. If everything worked, what would be the picture? So you kind of move them into the vision, right? And we found that, man, that is the most exciting part of the workshop. Because people don't typically get asked for the 29 to. Please unmute yourself, Mr. Zivi. There are people who are not muted here oh, who are disturbing the session. It happens. Colleagues, so, please don't 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 unmute. Let the speaker continue. So, so what then happens is that the visioning part is fantastic. You will not believe it. In almost every case, people come up with a mini national development plan mm -hmm. for their community, right? And we've had instances where people, the guy who drove the taxi that brought some of the people to the workshop is busy reporting on a portion of what was said because he was sitting there thinking, I'm just the driver. And then it gets to the visioning part. And he goes, hey, this is very interesting. And he gets involved, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say to you, and it's a long-winded answer, I know, it is to say everybody should do the visioning because in order to get to a common vision, we bring our visions to the table. And then you find that, hey, 80% is the same. So let us work on this part. That gives a sense of shared ownership of the vision rather than one party in the public private arrangement having a vision and the other one is a follower. And and where are the resources coming from? Who resources who, who put resources into this vision? Is it government? Because where we are sitting now, uh, we have seen government coming forward with the resources but these resources are always not enough. So who finance the same, I mean, the, 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 the vision that we all crafted? So can I tell you the beautiful thing? So the workshops themselves usually cost somewhere around 8,000 rand. It's coffee, tea, oros, scones, a, a cooked lunch, and a venue. And typically the venue is a church building. It's middle of the week, it's like a church building or a hall. Sometimes it's done under a tree, depending on where the very first democracy builder was in Venda. It was under a tree. I still mm. have the video, right? So in other words, don't let the circumstances uh, thing uh, worry you, right? As long as it's a fairly comfortable arrangement, you do that. The most important thing is the facilitator, the quality of the facilitator. People don't know that they're drawing a vision. When you ask that question that says, in an ideal world, how would this community work if it worked perfectly? 
they don't know that they're drawing a vision, yeah. right? So what I'm trying to say is, as long as people are gathered together in a room, if the facilitation is right, it works. The last thing I want to say, which if you want to, I can introduce you to the to the ex colleagues at Rivonia Circle. They have something called train the trainer. In other okay. words, you do a democracy builder for people who are then going to go and run workshops wherever they are. And their workshops are on steroids because they are able to get 100, 120 people into a room and it's a high speed one. So it may start at four and end at seven. But people walk out of the with a sense of how things should work and they divide themselves into groups. These guys deal with environmental issues. You guys are dealing with safety. You guys are dealing with transport issues. You guys are dealing with GBV uh, because they have decided these are the important things for them. Thank you so much for that. I think let me open the floor. I'll see by the raise of hands from our uh, colleagues who are in the attendance, those who want to engage with what you have presented, and maybe they might have a different view or obviously having the same view with you or also they want to see clarity on what you have said. I will want to then open the floor. Colleagues, please raise your hands and you will engage with our guest, Mr. Songezo Zivi, who was just unpacking the public private partnership model and how it has worked in other areas of his life, but also how he suggests it uh, to work going forward in our country. Let me open the floor. Uh, I will see the raise of hands, then I will put you on the floor to be able to engage him. I see this Mfunzeni Chindane. You can take over Mfunzeni Chindane. Then we will have Susan after you. Sure. Thank you, Talipani. And um, thank you, Mr. Sonjezo Zivi, for quite an interesting talk. Um, I must say, this was very fitting to bring in um, Sonjezo Zivi based on his experiences and also looking at his positioning, uh, coming. May 29th going forward. I think this really speaks to the work which some of us do. But I just want to go back and um, maybe just as an introduction, I'm Mfunzeni Chindane, but I'm here in my personal capacity. I work in this space um, on climate change adaptation. My question to you, uh, Sangezo CV, is um, you, you started off by indicating that in most cases, um, climate change, people think about the transition from coal and um, and it's much bigger than that. And I can say that I agree with you on that. Um, so what I want to put on the table and um, get your view is government has done kind of um, a sense finding which uh, bodes well to the vi to the visioning exercise where they've come up with um, a set of principles on, on the just transition of not just moving away from coal but also building resilience to climate change impacts it also talks to conservation it talks to um, uh, pollution it talks to um, water availability and all those things which uh, most of us here in, in the room um, are part of and um, linking those principles, the issues of equity and restorative justice and, and access to resources, and um, the, the, the whole point where you mentioned the pu public-private partnership, and for pub for private players who want to invest in projects which builds resilience to communities, are these are these principles friendly in in your sense in terms of um, the the access and, and equity um, a bits from 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 the presidential Co climate change commission, and yeah, just just your senses. I mean, is this maybe a new form of BEE which might woo away investors who want to play in this space? Um, your views will be welcome. Thank you. No, thank you very much. Look, I think one of the things I'm always very um, uh, generous with is that this is new territory for all of us. For government, it's new territory. For private citizens, it's new territory. Uh, there might be organizations, especially in the climate space, who are very knowledgeable because people are passionate about this and they're very knowledgeable. I think if you were to ask me what the missing link is, is, is what Wandile Sihlobo said to me, is information asymmetry. In other words, we don't first bring everyone up to the same level of knowledge, at least basic knowledge, right? So that we can then have a meaningful conversation. Let me make an example. 
I come from a village. My family are subsistence farmers, and everybody in our village is a subsistence farmer. For over a hundred years in that area, we've always planted maize at a certain time. And then we've always uh, weeded at a certain time and we harvest at a certain time. The climate has changed. The rainfall patterns are different. The seeds that you need are different. And, and, and. And so that has severely affected the, where the, 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 the crop yield that people get as a result all due to climate change. Now, a lot of people don't know this is caused by climate change. The farming timing has not changed. The farming methods have not changed. The seeds have not changed, right? Now, government comes with a broad uh, plan drawn up by people who are highly knowledgeable. The people who are supposed to benefit from this, you find sometimes unintentionally do not cooperate with the work because we have not brought everyone up to right to to the same to the same level i think if we can fix the information asymmetry especially in local government which is closer to the people we might get more success with what the commission is 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 trying to do because people are just more conscious of how they can modify their role and participate more meaningfully. The last thing I want to say is government also has a, and I understand the auditor general process can be a problem in that they say, yeah, you said you're going to do this at the end, you didn't do it. And therefore it didn't work out like that. You, you know, uh, the outcomes are poor. I think we need to create experimental frameworks because we're going to make some mistakes along the way stakeholders are difficult they don't always agree and 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 i think if we can generally introduce frameworks that provide for flexibility for stakeholder buy in and stakeholder modification we will see a lot more success thank you so much mr zivi i think uh, Kone, you are satisfied i mean uh, mr chindane i think you are i thought you, uh, i want to check if you are satisfied yes with I'm the good. answer OK, thank you so much. Susan Kone, please take the floor. Hi, hi, good evening, everyone, and thank you for this um, webinar. Very informative and very challenging to us who, wants to, who are passionate about uh, our environment. I only have two questions that I want to send to Mr. Zibi. Um, when you talk about shared vision, I'm, I'm trying to check um, private to private. Is it possible referring to big companies that are already in the market? If I may give an example, Envirosafe versus our small companies that are just entering the market. Is there a possibility of partnering with them? Can we do some of the programs together? And uh, the public, public to private, which is mostly our municipalities and our government, we sometimes really have a lot of challenges if we want to partner with them to, to attend to this type of challenges. And the last one, uh, it's our enterprise development programs. I'm not sure you were talking about your opportunity going overseas which is something that is part of the skills development, but we're still lacking a lot of enterprise development programs, which small businesses are not getting a, a ground to enter and be uh, trained to be participant in the climate change mitigation. And uh, thank you. My name is Susan Gone. Lastly, uh, I'm from PWK Waste Management and Recycling. Thank you. Susan, thank you very much. I think private to private partnerships, we, we really ought to be encouraged a lot more. And I will uh, just make a, a very quick example. So one of the things that I, I feel can if we if BEE is about economic redress, uh, we also need to think about environmental redress. And one of the things I'm quite happy to, I mean, assuming I was a king here. <laughs> in South Africa, <laughs> and yeah. I should just, you know, make a law, and it happens. 
as a general thing for me, given that the capacity of government is limited, the concept of uh, rebates and the like for private companies that have got the capacity that provide a mentoring, training, and other opportunities to smaller businesses and individuals would be would be enormous. So let me just share quickly one a, example I learned at Volkswagen. The financial director at the time was talking to the HR people about, they were complaining that the staff turnover is too high. And he asked how many people are leaving and they gave a number. He said, look, we are a big company, the biggest company here in uh, Utnik and Port Elizabeth. We have a responsibility to train people for the rest of the economy. When some of them leave, it's not a bad thing. We're not just doing the training for ourselves. It's not a bad thing. The pr problem is when we've got, we can't find people for ourselves, but the mere number of people leaving so that we can hire more young people to come into the organization and train them is not a problem for me financially. So please don't stress because it's part of our investment in the local area. And when those people come back with five more years experience outside, they enrich the company. Uh, you know, in terms of experience. So I, I think what I'm trying to say to you is, I think if we created frameworks for that to happen and they are clearly governed, you might see a lot more private to private. For instance, people who are close to retirement and usually companies get into this position where they want some people to start leaving. And those people for the last three years, all they're doing they're doing this kind of capacitation outside. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. If as a government, we need to give them a rebate for keeping those people on the books so they can capacitate 500 young people and small businesses, 100%, get them to do it. They've got the experience and that sort of thing. So that is why I think there's space of private to, to private. And the last thing about enterprise development, here's my frustration with the environmental discussion. People don't normally talk about the economic opportunity in the transition, mm. <laughs> right? It's like, That's true. we have to comply with this thing and oh, you know, like, no, 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 no. Every crisis has opportunities embedded in it. And I usually make the example on the campaign trail where I say, let's just imagine DSTV some years ago, all the installers were from DSTV. If we say every household needs to have solar power or similar on the roof, you train thousands of young people to become installers and maintainers of this thing. So they don't all come from large companies. You change the economics of the transition in that way. You don't just have to work in the factory. The person who's installing solar is a CEO who, who also like we see with take a lot and these kind of things. It's not a courier companies. Let's be innovative and find opportunity in the transition and empower people. And so what am I saying is, I often say that if that 7 billion they're talking about, they were to say, we're gonna ask for $500 million of that money to train young people and small businesses here to be kind of a benefiting from the transition. Again, fantastic. It's all in the thinking. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Zivi. I think you you are very interesting, and it's just because of time that we would have to stop. We'll have to stop here. And I don't know if you have got any last word before we then next move to our next uh, guest. Just thirty seconds, and that is, listen, the the work that you are doing, all of you, is not sexy. <laughs> okay, it doesn't <laughs> make it. It doesn't make it to Instagram, but if there ever was God's work, it's what you guys are doing. Uh, it's patriotic work, it's public service, and it is the work that uh, builds legacies. And 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 uh, you should uh, if you need any any assistance from me. I just don't know how I can help, but I am inspired by what all of you are doing because it's the kind of work that nobody else wants to do. And I'm really privileged that you guys invited me to come and speak here. And uh, if you need any kind of support from me, like I said, I don't know how, please just drop me a WhatsApp like you did, uh, Tarifuan, and uh, we can see what we do. I'm really inspired and thank you.
Thank you so much, Mr. Zivi. Uh, we really appreciate and we are looking forward to engaging you. We wish you all the best. We are then now moving to our next speaker. Uh, colleagues, you understand that today we are looking at two subjects. First one was public-private partnership, where we were engaging uh, Mr. Songezo Zivi, who has a lot of experience in working in public-private partnership space, where he was engaging different entities, like he indicated he worked uh, with Ford and all other. I mean, so we are going to then move to our next speaker. I think uh, he is here, Mr. Gabriel Tembuzani, who is going to be talking to us about personal branding as a secret weapon to success in modern society. Colleagues, you'd understand that when we are working in the conservation space, it's not entirely just, just about protecting the environment, but we are protecting the environment for people, not against people. Because people always understand, people always think conservation is you are protecting the environment and you, you don't want people to be part of it. So the reason we are also bringing the issues of personal branding towards uh, that, it's mainly to, share, to say you need to also know how you position yourself and how you can be able to be a brand that can attract investment, that can attract job opportunities. Because if you do not know how to build yourself as a brand, you might not even succeed in the work you do to uh, push conservation. So we've got Gabriel Temuzani, who is going to then engage us on that. Mr. Temuzani, how are you? Hey, namaste, Arorini. Nereone bafui. Yes, uh, we will then give you the platform. Please take us through your views and what you think about personal branding as a secret weapon to success in the modern society. Gabriel? Gabriel, are you able to hear me? I think he had a challenge. He just logged in again. Gabriel, are you back? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah. So I was saying you can then engage us, uh, give us your analysis, give us your, your perspective around the issues of personal branding as a secret weapon to success in the modern society. And this is entirely because we believe that when you are working in different platform, be it a conservation area or anywhere, you need to build a brand that is able to attract investment, that is able to attract employers, because you can't just be in the conservation uh, without knowing who you are as a person and without projecting and presenting yourself better. So please link, give us the value around personal branding and let's see if it is something that we need to be able to worry about as people and we are able to then engage ourselves in building the brand that can sell and attract okay. investment. Okay. Thank you so very I'm much. Um, Colleagues, can you please unmute yourself? Can you please mute yourself and allow our speaker to engage us? I see that people who are unmuted. Uh, you can continue, sir. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, um, one and all. Thank you so very much for this platform, that one, much, much appreciated. And I think it's the kind of platform that we as society, we as South Africans, we need so dearly so that we, we get to equip each other with precision tools that will help us, you know, navigate um, the, this journey of life that we find ourselves in, but also in the main to help us, you know, um, advance the kind of work that we do um, in different fraternities. And I think it is of paramount importance that we, we, we understand who we are and we, we immense ourselves in the subject matter or we immense ourselves in our, um, the fraternity that one is working, uh, Kayo. And by so doing, we'll be able to, to embody the personal brand in a man and way that carries much brevity. So um, I think all of us can agree that um, um, currently, um, the dynamics have changed drastically uh, when it comes to brain. 
marketing, marketing and, and advertising. But in the main, um, how one carries self um, has, has been redefined in a manner that um, if you, like you, you can have the best product, but if you don't know how to embody it and sell it or market it um, in the modern dispensation, uh, you will find yourself in, in, a, in a terrible or a problematic situation where you'll end up having your good product or good or good concept and sitting with it without knowing what to do. So personal branding um, can be used as a secret um, weapon uh, in the modern society or modern dispensation. Um, why is that important? It's important because it helps you um, to differentiate uh, yourself um, from others by highlighting mm -hmm. your, your unique skills, experiences, and personal traits. Uh, and I like it because it's a tool that, you know, uh, tells a unique story of who you are, where you've been, what you have you immersed yourself in, as I alluded earlier on. And um, it then gives you an opportunity to align yourself with those that will give you the opportunities that you need or bring you closer to the kind of business that you want to, to befriend or work with. Um, others would ask, Uri, why is self-branding important? Um, Self-branding is important or crucial uh, in the modern life because it can help you stand out in a competitive um, environment or platform market um, where you'll be able to attract opportunities and build strong network. Uh, and, and this is not just about um, marketing or promotion, uh, but it's about creating, what do I call this, a genuine authentic identity that um, resonates with your audience, that resonates with um, the people that you, 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 you're dealing with on that particular platform or avenue. So I'll, I'll try to compress um, my, 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 my story uh, in the interest of time so that we, we, we get to understand what uh, are some of the you know, things or pillars uh, that, can one, that one can use to advance or put you know colors to their brand as as as, as a person or as an individual so uh, maybe if we could look at four or five you know things that one can look at uh, number one it will be the purpose what's your purpose how do you want to go about your purpose and number two the value what what's your value number three brand clarity number four what's your strength um, number five number five as i alluded earlier on um authenticity how do you bring it home how do you marry it how do you embody it and 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 in anything and everything that you do once you bring authenticity people resonate with you better or people fall with that which you are talking much easier than you um not sounding authentic or not being authentic so to say so and and, and lastly is the issue of you know energy uh, what kind of energy do you exude? What kind of energy do you use as you speak about the subject matter or when you talk about yourself as a brand? And, and I think that's some of the things that we, we need to harness and immerse ourselves in, in a man and way that um, will help us to, to realize our, our dreams or our legacy or, or the brand that we want to realize in the long future. So I think in the, in the, in the interest of time, I will pause here and I think it's because Mr. Zibi has touched a number of things that, you know, align or are intertwined with this, what I'm talking about. So um, allow me to pause here and then we entertain a few questions before you, we wrap up. I see time is, is, is it's, 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 it's gone already. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel Tembuzani. Those who know him is Wafui on Mubango. So, Gabriel, I think before I open the platform, I just want to check with you because you have been a brand or you have built a brand, a character outside you that has been strong for over 20 years now. What is, what is your personal secret that you are able to say, I've built or I've worked in the character of Bafui uh, Azuindini? Because that brand, I think everyone resonates with. Everyone who watch Mwango likes that character. And what is the secret about building a character that can stay relevant in, 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 I mean, for more than 20 years, like you've done 
yourself? What is your personal secret to that? I, I, I thought we wouldn't go into that, but now that you have since brought it up, um, I, th I think when I joined the show back then, um, I was just a lighty, and I then asked myself, for it, what is that I can do that will make me last longer here? And uh, another element that came into being as um, I was growing up or continuing with the journey is that um, you'd find people get to be replaced or changed from time to time. And that phenomenon has um, infused um, a unique sense of fear or <coughs> made me have a fear as to um, uh, clearly that means that I can also be replaced here. So I then started, you know, devising means and mechanism of making myself unique and, and a prominent figure amongst the rest, uh, which then taps into what I alluded to earlier on the uniqueness and the how do you embody um, your brand in, in a unique way that makes you to be outstanding amongst the rest. So, so when you observe the character, you'll see that the character has got its own traits. Um, it has got its own uniqueness, its own colorful mm -hmm. elements that makes it unique from other characters. How the character speaks, how the character laughs, how the character answers the phone, and so on and so on. So, so and I think those are some of the traits that you know um, we need to marry them into our being, so that we 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 don't sound, we don't look and and read like everyone else and i think that's where um the ticket is in the in the in the modern dispensation yeah thank you i think that's that's the secret because that's what we want we are in the conservation space our organization deals with environmental related matters mm -hmm. but also when you are dealing with environmental related matters you need to understand that there is you behind that when you are cleaning when you are planting trees when you are doing all these things they, they should be a brand that people attach to. I always say people do business with people. So if you want people to do business with you, you must have an identity. And I like what you have just said about your uniqueness. Let me open the floor so that we can have a few comments or questions from the floor so that we are able to engage you. And like you said, from there, we'll then be able to move to a closure of our session. I see uh, Mosa Maru. I think it's Musa Ramaru, if I'm correct. Musa Marumo, yeah. Musa Marumo, please take the floor. Uh, hi, Darafani. Uh, it's actually Monde. I'm actually using somebody's phone right now. Oh, yes, Monde. How are you? I hope it's not I'm stolen, Monde. Wow. Yeah, you might find that it's a stolen phone, eh? <laughs> <That's> <laughs> joke. Not at all, eh? <laughs> Monde, you can take over. Yes, Um, my name is Monde Dai. I'm in marketing sector, right? And I, I actually want to ask uh, uh, Gabriel Bafoui that um, how do you then differentiate between a brand and yourself, right? Because you get like, for an example, I'm dealing with a lot of artists, right? Whereby as a brand, it becomes a different thing. And as a person, it becomes a different thing. So tomorrow, when we meet you by the mall, how do you then act? And when we meet you uh, at a certain event, so yeah, how how is it different from each other? Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Monde. Um, I think that's a a tricky question, but many a times we find people confusing or blurring the lines between the two. Um, but what is of paramount importance is to remain um as thyself, to remain as you are as a person. But because of the different um work that we find ourselves in and uh, different work in a sense that uh, when, when you are, how do I say this? When you're an actor, sometimes it's very difficult for people to get to know who you are as an individual and get to know the brand behind the character. So that's why I'm saying people tend to, to blur the lines between the two. But um, um, I, I define myself as an actor. I don't portray and define myself as a character in a in a show or a, I don't carry around the character from another show and go around with it because that will spell a disaster for me. Look, you go to places where, uh, of course, people watch a particular show, but they don't like the particular character and you are that character that they don't like, hypothetically speaking. So if you then go around with that as a brand, it becomes a problem. So you must be able to differentiate uh, between the two. And I, as an actor, 
I must be able to give that distinctiveness between the two. And, and outside the scope of the work that I do, I am a brand. And I'm a brand that is also aligned to a particular uh, work that I do or fraternity that I practice in professionally. I hope you, I'm making sense to you, Monday. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Thank you so much, colleagues. Let me see the second hand. I'm also looking at time. I want us to wrap the session. I see there is Mr. Maragane Jaldindelani. Please. Yes, uh, thank you very much uh, for, for the opportunity. Um, I would like to thank the two speakers for a very mouthful presentations that they gave out. Uh, mine is directed to Msanda, uh, yeah. uh, the most well-known and loved by the entire South Africa. Yeah. So I just want to check here, uh, Mr. Gabriel, could you kindly share with us in a moment the challenges that you faced as an individual from your childhood to where you are now uh, with the brand and 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 the and the, um, the famous you that you are today. So I would like to believe that you it was not simple to get to where you are and to also portray the character that you have uh, on the Sopi Mubango. And then everyone wants to be you. Everyone wants to be Bamsanda. When we introduce ourselves as vendors wherever, they will be like, oh, Bamsanda, eh, eh, batate, referring to you. So I just want you to share with us the challenges that you got and then how you managed to, solve, to, to, to overcome them so that you become who you are today. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, my brother. Much appreciated. Look, um, like any other, you know, um, young person growing up in the village, the challenges were <laughs> larger than mountains. But um, I think I just told myself that, you know, whatever that happens in life, I'll, I'll find myself going to school. And I looked around my family, my community, and I realized that there's no one who will take me to school. Therefore, I'll have to, 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 to double the effort in terms of working hard and put myself through school. And I did that in no time. And I take pride in the journey that I've traveled thus far. But in the main, you know, growing up in the village, you, you are compounded by an array of challenges where even where you come from, people look down upon you as a person or as a child to say, like this one, where will he go? If miracle happen, this one will only be, and not that I'm condescending upon other professions, or if miracles happen, this one will just apply for like, you know, um, police position and whatnot and whatnot and would never amount to anything. So, so that gave me the double edge and the audacity to do more, to, for me to realize, you know, the goals that I had for myself. And believe you me, today, I take pride in saying um, I've put myself through universities, I've put myself through different uh, higher learning institutions, and, and, and I can definitely say that I've become. And in the work environment, the dynamics are, are very, very, you know, diverse as well. You go into the work environment, when you're a newcomer, people look at you funnily, and they find it very difficult to open the circle for you to, to, to tap in. And if you don't have a strong character, if you don't know, or if you're not willing to craft your brand, you will, you will be swallowed by a feeling of despair and give up early. And, and those are some of the things that I encountered, but I soldiered on nonetheless, because I understood my struggle, I understood um, my purpose, as I alluded earlier on. And uh, amongst other things, um, for a brand to be a brand, you need to know yourself, you need to know what you want, and you need to devise means and mechanisms of how you're going to go about it, which I call precision tools that, you, that will help you to navigate this journey of, 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 of work, um, the journey of life, and so on and so on. I hope I've covered um, parts of your question. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you very much. Da, Muran. Yeah, thank you so much. We will then take the last question. Uh, it's from this mentor. I don't know who this person is. Please introduce yourself then. Uh, Gabriel, I think this is the last one. Then we close this the session. I see we are on two past seven now. I mean, two past five. No, but if we still have more questions, let's entertain them. And um, so that we pull up breaths and we don't have a residual of questions that, you know, emanated from this avenue that will never be answered. OK, <laughs> thank you. Uh, this mental, please take the floor. This mental, I see your hand is up and you are muted. Please unmute yourself and take the floor.
Okay. It looks like uh, maybe this person might have left the floor. Colleagues, is there anyone? Okay, I see they're having problem with mic. No, yeah, can you can. They you can, can type, type your question here on problem with the mic. Yeah, I understand that technology is a very, very difficult beast. It's it's not for everyone. Even us here in Tate, we are struggling with this thing. But uh, I was trying to put myself on video, and the next thing I'm out of the platform. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you can you can just try once, Gabriel, to put your camera so that people see you. I see there is another hand. Uh, is it Monday again? Here we are, Bafu <laughs> Vatate. Can you please call me Gabriel, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, through, through you, Jay. Through, through you, Jay. Uh, yes. Zanda, you, you are not doing justice. You can't, you can't present all this presentation and then you hide this most famous Bafu. Look at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Colleagues, That's, I see the that question. I'm very shy. Came. Oh. <laughs> I think the question just came here. Yeah? Uh, she said, I mean, this person said, you can't have multiple personalities for business, family, or work. Do you agree with this statement? Well, oh, surely you can. So, so, so the way you are, Talipani, when you are with us, it's not the same way when you are, it's not the same person that you are at home. Of course, you are one and the same person, but the elements and the dynamics are completely different, meaning you got traits that you... Uh, ooze when you are in a business space and you got traits that you ooze as a father and as a husband to somebody. So, 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 and the sooner we, we learn that skill, we become better people and we'll be able to align ourselves accordingly to different platforms. If you become one dimensional, it becomes a problem. It's like an actor who can only act as a police. It's like an actor who can only act as a chief. It's a problem. Uh, more producers won't see value in having you in their platforms or in their shows. So diversification and learning um, skills that will help you um, be a, 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 a unique person in a unique platform carries much brevity and it gives you the upper hand. Thank you so much. I see there is Henning Bonging Kosi. Please take the floor. Um, good evening. Can you please confirm if I'm clear? Loud and clear with Henning. Okay, I'm Bonko Sikama. I come from the biodiversity and conservation field. So I, I just wanted to ask Mr. Gabriel, once and once again, I would like to thank the platform and the opportunity. And then my question is, how do you advise someone who wishes to have a strong um, personal branding, however, that person is not clear of their own direction? So, uh, and that's very rampant out there. And you would find even uh, my colleagues who are from institution of higher learning struggling with the same phenomena. But as people, as mankind, we, we, we are not tailored the same and our, our strengths are not the same. So from time to time, you need to uh, devise means and, and ways that will strengthen you or reveal the real you and equip you with um, tools that will help you become a better person and, and sharpen your craft in a way. What am I saying by that? Um, it, it is advisable to get, um, in, in, in the field that I work in, which is acting, you have acting coach, um, you've got a language advisor, or a language coach, and the voice coach as well. And these are the people who are gonna help you to reflect on yourself. These are the people who will help you to stand in the mirror and look at yourself with a different eye. And in no time, you then realize that there's growth that has manifested. And growth will never, will never be enough unless it makes you good for life. Growth will never be enough unless it makes you good for that which you're doing. I hope I've, I've, I've covered you know, um, the chunk of your question. Yes, you, you have the, you've covered everything and more of what I wanted to know. So yeah, thank you, thank you very much. I think I think in the in this context, the phrase that says time waits for no man uh, does not apply. So it's not about time, if I'm not mistaken. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much, Gabriel. Before I take Tabero Makwarela, then uh, Susan Kone. I think Susan Kone will be the last one, Gabriel. I see you are enjoying this. It's a beautiful session. I need to tell you 
one thing that, that is important for us. We are in a space where we work with a lot of environmental NGOs, small organizations. Yeah. They are started by people in rural communities, and these people do not have an experience of being exposed to space where a brand matters. They, 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 what they know is their product. But well, now they are cleaning. That's what matters. For, I mean, that's what they, they care about only. But the reason we had this session, Gabriel, was to say people must understand that as much as you love your product, as much as you have it defined, as much as you are able to, to plant a thousand trees, you still need to be able to present this that you do to the funder. You still need to present this what you do. I mean, to, to ever might have interest in what you do. So, and that's why we spoke about the issues of personal branding, because as much as you might be a very strong uh, person in tree planting, you need to also know how to take what you do and go present it, sell it for investment. And, and you need to build yourself to a space where you can talk about it. And that's why you spoke about the issues of your voice, co your voice coach, your language coach, and all that. So I think when you wrap up the session, just emphasize on that because there are two things that are happening, uh, whatever you represent, but there is yourself as well. How do you marry the two and be able to take them to the market where I will say they are doing something beautiful, but also they know how to sell it. They know themselves. Someone told me that if you are clean and you are able to present yourself, it gives you 35% advantage already. Yeah. But if your, your documents, your presentations, everything is not clean, uh, it gives you negative 35%. So before we even listen to what you are doing, we are already frustrated because it's not well structured, it's not well presented. Let me hear Tabero and Kone as the last speaker, then you will reflect on that. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair, for this opportunity. And uh, let me extend my greeting to uh, Mr. Gabriel. It's like you actually know what I'm going to ask, uh, Chair, because you touched base on on what I wanted to to ask. But in addition to that, uh, Mr. Gap, is your personal trace um, has any impact um, to your? you know your 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 professional world and how do you manage you know uh, or how do you upkeep you know with all the trends that is happening you know the likes of your you know your social medias and 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 how do you how do you keep up with that thank you please paraphrase again my apology Tavero, please paraphrase. He, he wants you to uh, repeat your question maybe in a different angle. No, my my interest, I want to know that it's, it's, it's your personal traits has an impact um, on your on your on your professional, um, um, you know, or on your career. And with all the trends that it's happening, how do you upkeep? How do you keep up um, with you know your social media world and 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 so on? You know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Muna, welcome to Tumamuna. But to answer your question, um, I, I I think at some stage, somewhere, somehow, there is. How do I call this? There's influence, okay, rather, this reciprocatory that happens in between, meaning Gabriel can influence the character and the character can influence Gabriel. But the distinctiveness thereof is how do I carry myself in a manner and way that the viewer does not then read Gabriel out of the character? When I'm outside the character or when I'm at home or in the social space, how do I then carry myself and to a point where those that I'm with, they don't read the character in me that they've seen somewhere. They relate with me on a personal capacity and they see Gabriel, not the character that they've seen in some show. And I think, and I think that's, 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 that's what it takes. But in the main, frankly speaking, um, acting, it's, it's, a, it's, a, 
It's a replica of reality. We replica real life. What we do, it's influenced by real life. So if I remove myself, there won't be real life because that real life must be delivered by me. It must be embodied by me. Or I'm the reference thereof to that real life. So with my social media, mm, I try to keep up with the social media. But again, I choose the kind of content that I want to put out there because it then becomes um, aesthetics to the brand that I am or that I've become. And it, 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 you brought another element that is very crucial in the modern world that we find ourselves living in. You know, the invention of social media, modern technology, has robbed a lot of us, our being and our... Um, our social being. So it's very crucial on how we tackle and engage on social media because uh, a lot is going haywire in social media and people are losing themselves because of social media. And you, you see it with our own kids. If you are not careful, your child can stay on social media, be it TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, from morning till sunset. And at the end of the day, there's nothing tangible that they've gained out of it. There's nothing profitable that they've done uh, throughout the day. So it's, it's very crucial uh, how we manage ourselves around that aspect. But at the same time, you know, you tap into digital marketing. You can still use the same, you know, internet and social medias to do business in a manner and way that is more profitable. So it's a controlled space that needs concerted effort. And again, you need to be familiarized with the dynamics and be given precision tools of how to navigate yourself around that so that you can advance the agenda that you're pushing or, or the work that you're pushing or the products that you're selling. I hope I'm making sense, my brother. I see him clapping, which means he is happy with, with your feedback. Uh, let's get the last one, colleagues. I want us to close the session now. It's quarter pass. Uh, Susan Kone, please be our last uh, contributor of the day. Hi, thank you, Chair. And I'm going to go to the next one. I'm going to go to the next one. Hey, branding is number three. Number one in Rubisa Mashika. So. <laughs> Thanks for, for sharing the information. Uh, Chair, I just want to make a proposal to you. Uh, mm. I think with the climate change uh, scenarios that we are having now, I think as the people who are in the green environment, there's a lot that we have to do to mitigate what is happening. So my proposal is concerning the issue of uh, public-private partnership. Is it possible for you to reschedule or to have another session where we really unpack some of those? Why am I saying this? I'm a waste collector and a recycler. Uh, as a brewery, it's one of the big companies that are polluting, as well as our red and white, which is uh, Coca-Cola. So when you try to go to those people on your own, you really don't get any chance of getting through. So I just want us to try to unpack that as well as trying to get ways of how do we engage so that we can reduce and um, uh, recycle whatever it's sitting in our shores or in our rivers. So that's my proposal for you to have a session specifically focusing on public-private uh, enterprise, uh, uh, public-private participations or partnership. Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for that, Wokone. We really appreciate Gabriel, and I think she touched on something that I want you to close with. Uh, you will also just add your own closing remarks. She said, I am a waste picker. Yeah. Personal branding is the third thing on the line. Yeah. And the reason we brought this session here, or the reason we created this session, was to also align personal branding to be not far away from what you do. Because if you do it and you do not have a brand attached to what you do, it, it might not give you more leverage. So just close with that. Just 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 touch what she said. I'm a waste speaker, and that's what I'm concerned about. Personal branding is the third thing on the line. What's your take on that? And and you give us your closing remarks. So so the writer says it is no use saying we are doing our best, we'll have to succeed in doing what is necessarily needed. Oh, sorry. 
it, yeah. somebody talking? No, 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 please continue. I think she, she had not uh, muted herself. Oh, OK, cool. I was saying, um, the writer says, I quote, and close quote, it is no use saying we are doing our best. We'll have to succeed in doing what is necessarily needed. And at this time and point, what is necessarily needed is to take care of the environment. And if you are an activist and a practitioner in that fraternity, the onus is still incumbent of, uh, on you uh, as to what is that you're doing? How are you doing it? And how do you go about it in the main? Why am I saying this? You know, we find people or practitioners who practice in the particular fraternity, yet they are ashamed to be associated with that which, with, which they do, yet it's the same thing that gives them their livelihood. It can be that in the 21st century, we got practitioners who hide or who are ashamed of who they are. What you are is what brings you bread on the table. And, you know, sometimes people have the greatest of ideas, but because they, they are ashamed or they are shy, rather, to express themselves in front of people, they... They, they fail because of that. And there's no, there's no shame in outsourcing or getting somebody who will come and do a presentation for you. There's no shame in, in collaborating as, as practitioners and as different entities so for you to realize your bigger goals. And that's where us as Africans are failing. You travel and go to countries like Asia. Those people are big in collaboration. You go to India. Those guys are big in collaboration. You find somebody in, in China um, selling, um, um, let's say, blankets, and then you order a number of blankets, and that person does not have. He won't say, I don't have. He will go and outsource from his friends, and he will, he will make sure that the products are delivered on time, and purely so, meaning uh, uh, or on par. So, us as Africans, that's the biggest enemy that we have, and that's failing as big time. And in no time, it, actually, let me finish with this, that says, it embarrasses me to see more and more learned or educated Africans who are failing. I then ask myself, what was the use of us going into the class if we're going to come out here and wait for others to bring solutions and fail dismally in that which we want to realize? So I'm saying to all the people who are on this platform, guys, let's collaborate. Let's outsource that which you don't have. And, and let, let's befriend each other on, on, on value. What value are you bringing? If you're not bringing any positive value, uh, let's reconsider the relation. Let's reconsider the, the association. Because come I tell you, the more you associate yourself with people who are not interested in seeing you advancing or progressing. <laughs> I read. Anyway, in conclusion, allow me to quote um, Wangari Matai, um, who is the first woman um, in the Central Africa to receive a job train in the same platform that we're talking about or in the same fraternity that we're talking about. And this is what she said. She said, um, if we are able to send people to the moon, why, can we, why can't we not plant trees? This is still relevant till today. It still carries yeah. much gravity today. So I think I think let's, let's make it a point that we go out and protect our nature. Let's make it a point that we go out and become ambassadors and activists who are not ashamed like Wangari Matai, who was a soldier, who the, even the, the United Nations acknowledged and they gave her uh, the Nobel Prize. And she did not win that by osmosis. She won that because she was challenged, but she soldiered on nonetheless. And I'm saying, comrades and colleagues, you can soldier on until something positive happens. You can continue on this trajectory until that award comes. And it's not necessarily about the award that is tangible things. It's the satisfaction that one gets out of the work that they're doing. And it is possible. It is possible. If, if you're doing things that don't serve your passion or your interest, it, it becomes difficult to realize your goals and your agendas. And with those words, thank you so very much for affording this opportunity. And I think we'll meet next time. But if we fail to meet next time, I'll visit in your dining room as always, nine o'clock, SABC 2. Nah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Gabriel. We really appreciate your inputs and we are very much happy. We wish you all the best in your life every day. We understand we have seen you doing a lot of work outside your acting. We want to wish you all the best. But I think in closing from our side, we want to thank all the two speakers who participated from uh, Songe Zivi who came in and unpacked the issues of public-private partnership and indicated that indeed it's a model that is doable, it's a model that assists in terms of achieving 
a shared vision. You came in, Gabriel, and spoke about public, I mean, you spoke about the personal branding as a secret weapon to success in the modern society. And the reason we did these two topics was entirely to say we are in the environmental space. We understand our biggest business is conservation, but we are not doing conservation against people. We are doing conservation for people. For people and yeah. because of that, we need to understand that our first business is uh, human advancement. And in the process of advancing humanity, we need not to neglect that which we share, which is our planet. And that's why we, we, we then felt it's important to also touch these aspects that were called soft skills for uh, environmental practitioners. We want to encourage each and every person out there who thinks they might have something strong to share with us. Our platform is open. We have got the Universal Greening Network. It has over 1,500 members. We want to continue sharing with them. If it's environmental related, which is technical, we are open to have those sessions with people who feel they are strong and they are able to come and share their information because this is expert-led discussion. But even those who have got soft skills that they think it's important for people to learn and grow, we are open for, for that engagement. Colleagues, with that being said, I want to respect all of you, all those who participated with questions, comments, we are looking forward to also having you on our next session. Everyone who attended this session today, we want to appreciate you. We want to thank you for your time. We are having these sessions every month. So in a month, we have two sessions. Uh, probably, I mean, normally it's around the 11th or the 12th of the that month and the 25th or the 24th, depending on the day. But it's normally two sessions. And we want to invite you to come and join these sessions going forward. Gabriel, we are planting trees, my brother. Please, let's plant trees wherever you are. I've, as a farmer myself, I've made that my prerogative, and that's what I advocate for anywhere and everywhere. And it gives me a profound sense of joy and satisfaction in knowing that um, the coming generation will find a sober space that is green because of our deeds. And I'm saying to my colleagues on the platform or friends in the platform, let's, let's soldier on unashamedly. Let's soldier, let's soldier on without seeking rewards. Yes, rewards help us, you know, uh, to go forward and, and encourage us. But sometimes, you know, let's 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 build the legacy for the future because the future is coming. But will the future come and find an environment that is conducive and eco-friendly now? And that should be our question that we ask ourselves continually. Thank you so much, colleagues. I want to officially then declare this meeting urgent. Thank you, colleagues. You can then leave the floor.